Welcome to everybody. And uh, I have, thanks to my wonderful husband, live, well, almost live footage. So those are my kids. I hope you heard some of that or any of that, but that is, uh, my husband was given uh, an instruction, go make them do something together. So he, he recorded that about uh, five minutes ago. Thank you, Erin. Uh, those are my kids and my dog. The other dog was supposed to start seeing, which he usually does, which is yet another version of a, a perturbation. Um, it's to try and get us uh, thinking about what I've, I've tried to use as a theme for today, which is the dynamic time course of group interactions. And uh, so again, to uh, share my screen, uh, I will, uh, without uh, playing the video again, hopefully tell you that I'd like for our conversation to progress. It doesn't have to be in a linear way from top to bottom, but across these uh, four major topics. Um, one thing which has been mentioned, but not really in too much detail, is how we initiate group synchrony, which I think is so important when you go beyond the dyad, because it's just quite hard to decide to do something hard, like couple to multiple agents. Um, and I've listed a couple of questions that I think might be useful to, to stimulate our discussion. Uh, then how do we maintain group synchrony? Again, this is super hard, as you saw with my kids, they have distractions, they have different expertise, uh, they're trying to harmonize. Um, so how do we do that? And I've got a couple of questions which try to focus on how, what, to, what to quantify when we think about maintaining group synchrony. Um, and then something that's been mentioned a lot, so uh, something we've, we've probably already uh, got some ideas about, is these important transitions, uh, say for example, from the initi initiation phase to a couple phase, whatever that is, um, transitions when you change leader, transitions when you decide to harmonize, transition following the dog coming in, getting in your way. Um, and, one of the big questions I have is, will these transitions all look the same? And I'm looking at Pedro for whatever reason, my, my, my Zoom has decided to focus on you, Pedro, so hello. Um, you know, thinking about what you do, uh, which is looking at, at, at sports teams, uh, you know, if you think about the transitions in, in those, the phases in the real world, I think one key, key question I have is whether those transitions look the same at a, at a, at a computational level. Um, and then something that I think is super important uh, and which of, there's only very little uh, research done is this idea of uncoupling. You know, my kids have to decide to stop singing, to stop being coupled and go their separate ways. And what does the data look like uh, there? Does it look like the opposite of initiation? Um, and because we've had a lot of people uh, talking about the, the, the more neural level of things, uh, and I see that Suzanne has joined us, what, do, what does this and all these other uh, phenomena look like in the brain? So those are just some ideas uh, they do not have to be what we talk about at all. In fact, we can talk about anything. We are free agents, but we are also a group. So hopefully we dynamically can find a way to coordinate. I see that some of you are on mute and some of you are not. We are all uh, adults. If you can be on unmute, so if you don't have dogs and kids barking and barking, uh, then you can unmute yourself and we can just have a nice discussion. If you feel like you need to be more formal and raise your hand, that's also cool. But I think we can all as adults uh, try and coordinate ourselves. But maybe to, to, to throw the ball out there, um, Pedro, maybe we can um, go back to uh, what you were saying about the different forms of data, because maybe before we think about what we do with the data, maybe we have to be aware that maybe we're looking at different contexts, different kinds of data. Yeah, 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 I can try. Uh, as well, nice to see you. Hi, hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. Okay. As, as, I, as I start saying, uh, the thing is, most of the data that we have from badminton or from rugby or even from football are positional data, X and Y coordinates of the player that we use to calculate velocities, interpersonal distances, angles between players, whatsoever. The thing is, most of the movements and most of the interactions that happen within a, a court or a pitch are 
everything else than the linear or cyclical. So that is one main issue that we know learn how to deal because most of the, the, the tools that we have so far, for instance, the relative phase that was quite used by Scott Kelso a few years ago to, to capture the transitions and properties of dynamical systems in human movements was, was built for, for cyclical and repetitive movements. And when people try to use these kind of tools in a non-linear and non-cyclical movements as a trajectories of players in a football field, the kind of data that we have violate the main assumptions that are required to use the relative phase. And we st we're still struggling with this issue. For instance, me and Joao now, we are, we are trying to explore and, and we import a concept called the uncontrolled manifolds developed by Greg Schoner and, and Schultz in 1999, I think, which basically aim to capture synergies between players. And the, 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 the main thing is, uh, when two players adjust to each other in a badminton court or in a rugby field, they adjust to each other to stabilize something, okay? For instance, they adjust to each other to stabilize the interpersonal distance between them. Ooh, we've lost Pedro. We'll give him a second to, to come back. But Joe, do you want to maybe uh, jump in there? Because perhaps you have uh, you have a sense you've already you know got into his head. Just make sure you're unmuted. Okay, okay, uh, I'll keep up. So the 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 main thing that the Pedro was trying to explain the 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 tool that we are using the uncontrolled manifold. Uh, the basic idea is that when we have we're trying to find. Um, uh, somehow how the system uh, works uh, to stabilize. Um, and so uh, let me try to put this in a, in, a, in a very simple way. We have like two variables uh, that work together to stabilize a performance variable. Uh, and so this could be uh, like uh, in a, a synchronism. Sorry, sorry, sorry. 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 Oh, okay, Pedro, if you want to keep up, uh, I was trying to explain how the manifold uh, works. Um, works. Yeah. Um, maybe then you can, I'll try to, to, to post a more theoretical <laughs> approach. Then you, you, you put your example into, okay. Okay, into okay, team okay. sports. Uh, so the basic idea is trying to, to find a system that is dependent on two, imagine the simple one would be two variables trying to stabilize a search a variable that we will call a performance variable. So um, this tool, the uncontrolled manifold, uh, allow us to, 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 to see if they these two variables, what we call task element variables, they work together to stabilize this, the, the performance variable. Um, this uh, uh, has been applied within the human body, with human body kin kinetics and dynamics, within interlimb connection, for instance, to, for a person to, to grab something uh, from a position, the, the muscles in the arm and the forearm can work in different ways to, 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 to go for the same objective, okay? Uh, and, and this is what we call a synergy, and it's basically evaluating how the, um, uh, how the, the, the variance in the, in the, in the variables, um, uh, is, is what we call a good variance or a bad variance. If it's a good variance, we call it, it's like uh, um, it's working towards the goal of keeping the performance variable very stable. So this has been done, the, the apply, uh, applying this uncontrolled manifold has been done within the human body, but now we are trying to expand this between different persons, okay, in different elements. One variable would be associated to one person, the other variable would be associated to the other person, and the task performance variable would be some common goal objective. Yeah, just let me just let me tell something that might be, be interesting for, for the rest of the group. Imagine that, um, okay, for most of your tasks, the people aim, the participants aim to synchronize to each other. So you all have measures of synchrony, right? So we can say that uh, a goal 
is to keep that synchrony relatively stable. So that might be a performance goal. But for, for that happens, for instance, two musicians must, uh, must adjust to each other when they are playing some music to stabilize that kind of synchrony. So when this happens, we can say that a synergy occurs. Okay, so, so the main concept that we are using now, just to, to finish our, our talks here and give the opportunity to the other guys also provide some input, is these. Two components or more components of a system adjust to, to each other to stabilize something. Imagine when we have a crowd walking, everybody adjusts to each other to keep the synchrony of the mob, for instance. Okay, I'm, I, I don't know if, if I was clear or, or if you have any questions. Just let me pass the ball to Maxon because I really like one idea that Maxon said yesterday about the topology. One thing that we, the, the, the uncontrolled manifolds, it's a, it's a, it is a subspace, it is a geometrical subspace with some kind of characteristics. When a synergy occurs, that, that manifold has some kind of characteristics which we don't know what they are. We, we cannot measure that kind of property. So I'm quite interested in, in, in the work that uh, Maxon presented yesterday. Fortunately, fortunately, I know very well Scott Kelso and he sent me the paper. And thank you for it all, Maxon. So I will read the paper carefully because I really enjoy the idea of the topology. So Merle, I don't know if, if I can pass the ball to Maxon because I really would love to, to hear about the, the, the idea of, of the topology and especially how to measure the, the, the properties of that kind of topological ob objects, if, if this is correct. I only wish you could actually pass the ball. Imagine how cool it would be if, if Zoom gave us the ability to literally <laughs> throw her the ball. Go ahead, Winston. <laughs> yes, I, I, I touch it. Um, so yeah, thank you for the interest. And I think I, I've been thinking about this um, for a while of how to measure synergy. Um, as I was observing these A person interaction data, when I found out they don't really synchronize. <laughs> and uh, I look at the single trial data every day and I think interesting things are happening, but whatever that is, that is not what we're used to. And uh, so I, I started to think about, oh, how do you really quantify synergy? And manifold is is idea is very important when we think about synchronization. Uh, we're thinking about the the we're collapsing the entire possible state of the system to a simple manifold that is a hyperplane. That is if you think of the structure of, of what synchronization would be. And, uh, but in reality, it's not, it doesn't have to be a plane. So it, the, the point of that is a manifold is that it wraps around or something like that. Um, so something that I didn't show um, in the talk um, was that I also did some um, more theoretical work on uh, what is happening, what could happen, and what kind of coordination could happen when people have different frequency, is that um, near this uh, regime of metastability, so just right uh, before they can synchronize, uh, they can change slightly and their coordination will sort of actually create um, periodic orbits or manifolds of different topology. So this part I, I didn't really show, um, but I found out it's like thinking about the topology of their coordination is, is very important uh, in the, the rhythmic setting, but it's also easily transferable to other settings. Uh, and I have recently went to um, some uh, applied math uh, workshop and they are like looking at topology from their tool developers perspective, but they apply first, they apply that to flocking uh, so, so that's a different kind of collective action uh, for birds, but not necessarily for, for people. But the idea is the same, is that you have, well, for birds, you have 3D location of how, how is the flocks going to uh, change its topology, um, maybe when they see a predator, which is they need to perform in a certain sense and to stay away from the predator, or they need to scare away uh, the predator. So, um, there is a, a, it's a transferable idea to say how is uh, the, uh, what is the topology of the organization of, of multiple people or birds moving in space. So I think that's a, a idea that's transferable. What is not, um, what I think is, is sort of a bridge, so, social bridges. So the topology is sort of a bridge that can connect what I was familiar with about uh, rhythmic coordination transferable to a setting that is not entirely rhythmic. Uh, 
that you have built a bridge with a topology, but what is the sort of the mechanism or the, 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 the mathematical principle that's drive the formation of, of these different topological patterns or switching between different topological patterns would be uh, need a little bit more work about how to really model that. I think the benefits of having the rhythmic part is we, I know how to model that, but for the real life uh, scenario, it is, it is probably uh, absurd to assume that you can just model it, uh, that, you know, that's a very rich behavior. So the topology can uh, give you some sense of uh, build a connection through the measurement. And, and I want to say, I also want to say that I, there are different ways of uh, maybe quantify the manifold and, and capture the synergistic aspects. But th there is um, the method that I presented, I didn't talk too much about uh, the details is that it actually measured the summary of the topology of the manifold that's called homology. Homology is uh, the counting of holes. So uh, if you still remember the um, uh, uh, analogous, uh, I would say, um, uh, quantities that you might be familiar with is you know that for Euclidean geometry, if you have a cube or something, you know the relationship between the number of vertices, the edges, and and the the um, the number of faces. So they um, you minus one and plus one together, you have two. That's all a characteristic for uh, any like closed cubes or uh, any circle or uh, shapes that with one cavity inside of it. So this this Euler characteristic really capture that one cavity in variety type of shapes. Uh, I don't know if I'm talking very abstractly. Um, so um, and this homology in the more simpler sense is that, uh, for example, a circle, you will have one uh, hole embedded in two dimension, at least need to be embedded in two dimension. And that is the, the, the idea of what is not there is describing the synergistic aspect of, of the points on the circle. I think it was very appealing to me because you do not get a circle by studying the property of each points on the circle. You cannot also just look at part of the circle and think, oh, that's almost a line, right? And you, and you don't know that will connect to the circle. So what, what the, like finding the homology of, of the uh, circle is really there are um, a lot of tools out there um, to aggregate properly the local connectivity information and find out how many holes there are in this space. And that gives you a really um, collective levels of measure, a description of this, uh, this shape. It's not complete, it's a huge reduction of information, but this information, whatever that is, would be the synergistic aspect of that, of that manifold. Uh, but of course, I think um, the, um, the cavity would be, it's, it's, uh, it is reduced information. I would, uh, I would imagine that in uh, real world applications, uh, um, things, other factors will matter for the performance. So it might not be the, um, the homology may, may not be sufficient information to give you all the relevant uh, information about performance, but it, but it would that do give you a purely synergistic, uh, in, my, in, my, in my lingo, a purely synergistic description of the space. And if somebody has somebody, something to say in response to Meng Sen, I picked up on three things. Um, one is this concept of reduction of information, which when you're thinking about this really rich, dynamic time course data, whether it's just at the behavioral level, and I don't mean just as in just, but you know, at the behavioral level, at the neural level, or if you're lucky enough to have both, we have to constantly play with the balance between Reducing things to actually know what we're looking at versus, you know, not losing out on, on some of that richness. And so that's that's one of the big uh, one of the big issues we have to deal with. So if anybody has thoughts about that, that was one point. Um, then I picked up on another thing that uh, was mentioned and which ties in with the talk by Suzanne earlier, which is, you know, what does this uh, what does synchrony, what does synergy or coupling? And we're using lots of different words. So maybe another thing is we have to get our terminology straight. But 
you know, what does it actually mean? And, and I really like that, uh, you know, within the context of sports or the context of art, you know, you have, or, or learning you know, in, in education, you have a direct behavioral outcome that you actually want to measure as a function of that coordination or synergy or coupling or synchrony. Um, and so I just think that that's something we have to constantly bear in mind because of spurious coupling, you know, spurious uh, coordination between signals. So that's a second point that I think would be definitely worth uh, thinking about. And then the third one, which might maybe get uh, some more discussion from some of the other people is when you think about different contexts and therefore different data, you know, you have different problems you have to encounter and uh, that you're challenged by. And we've got people here who, who talk and do work on talking on, on, on conversation here, so dialogue. Um, which is not necessarily the case, say, in a lot of music making, where often you're, you know, you're playing together in time, and there's a little bit of give and take, a little bit of a, you know, a to and fro, but definitely in sports, and definitely in education, and definitely in, in some of like the, the team problem solving that Travis does, you know, there's a lot more of this, this back and forth, and so that's another really big difference to a lot of the sort of ensemble uh, data that we've been looking at, so if anybody has things to say about any of those three things, Jump in now. I don't know who to throw the ball to, but maybe uh, Caps. Throwing it to me. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think the important part here is that the context matters. So I'm going to pick up on that point, and and that's something that I struggle with. That every task that I might choose to study team dynamics in. Uh, the pattern of coordination could be different, and so it's it's almost to me like we need some kind of context sampling to really understand what function there is to some form of coordination. And I don't have a good solution for that. Uh, although, you know, we can uh, control to some extent the not necessarily spur spurious coupling, but what we would observe due to our task alone, you know, like, uh, I guess what we call kind of partialing out the, the coordination due to what the task demands. And, and I think this came up a bit in, uh, in Ido's uh, uh, talk, or at least I was reminded of that when he said that, um, yeah, well, this could be that it's, they're, they're all engaged in the same task. So maybe that's why we see this same kind of uh, sort of neural synchrony that, uh, that we observe. And I know there are some studies too, if you're watching a movie together with someone, you're also probably going to have very similar activation patterns. So how do you sort of, get out this thing that's just due to the context and also what's really important to that context, at least what differentiates, for example, good performers in this context from bad performers. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a, a good answer, just that it's important. By context, do you mean the external stimulus? Is that where you're uh, basically? Okay, yeah. It could be the, the stimulus, it could be the context, whether they're in the classroom, right, or wh what they're particularly learning about, maybe learning about one subject and the things they do is different than uh, some of the other. And I yeah, think so I don't know that that's diff that part is different from any kind of experimental design that we would do, right? Like where you're, you're trying to think about any kind of confound, including the context and uh, first, first thing, like figuring out the way that you can design an experiment not to, like in our case for, the, for the classroom, for example, it was problematic, obviously, but the way that we try to somewhat solve it is to come in, go into the class multiple times and see if there is a consistency uh, independent of time of day or, you know, like month of the year. Like we also try to look at whether, you know, these things might vary, you know, at the end of in November, kids were applying for, you know, college, but that might affect their engagement or learning or things like that. Um, um, and then for, you know, for the stimulus and training, so there are some people are thinking about ways, obviously, in which you can, uh, you can, uh, you know, filter out the instantaneous correlations that you would expect based on just, you know, uh, on, on just stimulus and uh, stimulus and um, styles. But what I, if I can, I would wanted to ask about context too in the, um, and more about like thinking in terms of the tools that you, if these factor into your model. So I'm very naive about these kinds of models that you guys talk about. And so I'm, I'm curious to know about, learn more about um, how the, the tools that you have at your disposal factor into the likelihood that you might obtain synergy or coordination. So if you think about simply this kind of context, you know, verbal coordination works 
pretty much okay, but we all know that as soon as we're trying to coordinate in music, this will all fall apart instantly, right? Because it requires much tighter coupling. So that might loosen a parameter, I can imagine, or something like that. And the same I was asking, so what we're, um, uh, what we what we did is um, we threw a bunch of people into a space and gave them, you know, a real time reflection and like sonification of their emotions. And we're kind of hoping and maybe even expecting that there would be some sort of, you know, not maybe immediately, but at some point they would give each other space to like find their own soundscape and to create, you know, what we might do when we're giving instruments from a young age on, because we were learning, you know, that if we're giving instruments, like we're, we're supposed to create harmony and create a, uh, you know, something that sounds like, uh, like a musical piece uh, together. But people don't do that at all when they're, at least in our experience, with like uh, motion, uh, sonification or visualization, right? They're just like, it's total cacophony for, <laughs> for forever, basically. There's no changes. And that was really interesting and surprising to me because I think that if we were to have given them a drum set or a flute or a guitar, then they would try to find some sort of coordinator or synergetic system. Um, but they weren't look, didn't seem to even look for it. Um, so I'm really curious to hear about people here who know, who maybe know answers to those kinds of that. If somebody wants to jump in, I won't be the only one who speaks. I talk all the time. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks for jumping in. Uh, no, so I, I, I think that's a really interesting question. And sort of, I, I think if, if, oh, links in, are you jumping in? Oh, I, I yeah, I would, I would try to jump in. Like, no. sort of, we're going back to um, the, the measurement issue of, how do we define synergy? And uh, I was just thinking about, um, so I was trained by Scott Kelso. So I, I've, been, I've been doing the synchronization, uh, the phase locking and et cetera, a similar measure forever. And as I said, the um, introducing multiple frequencies uh, give you a different feeling of, of um, people do coordinate and when they're not synchronized, but this is a different type of coordination that I think is fascinating. And that's how go back. I got into topology, but besides that, what I think is interesting is when when we think about synergy. I think in the context of this group, we probably think about oh, this is this patterns of coordination, and then we switch to another patterns of coordination. And these two are different kind of synergies, different organizations. Um, but both in the, the sort of modeling of the human coordination, and then then right now I'm modeling brain coordination. Um, I found out it's really interesting to think about how they transition from different synergies or just different patterns. And that gives you the sense of the real coupling uh, level, level, levels of interaction that these elements actually have. Um, so so the, the connecting um, part between the synergy, I think is important, but um, it's probably more important in, in the real world setting when what you're doing is mainly a transition between different types of patterns rather than you're stuck in one pattern forever. Um, and I think, yeah, this is was what, what I was studying, this brain region coordination. And there were um, theories of, oh, the brain regions are coordinated. In this synergy, we near a tractor. Everything is stable, but it seems like it doesn't solve, it doesn't reflect the data very well. The, the, what, what reflects the data really well is if I simulate the transitions between different patterns. And that will, the, uh, that is where the nonlinearity in the, in the interaction really kicks in is, is, uh, is we, I'm talking a little bit abstractly from the theories aspect, if you are really close to a stable pattern, then things are more or less linear in that near that particular, um, uh, regime. But uh, as you're moving from different stable patterns of coordination, and that's where you will have nonlinear interaction, a small change in one person might uh, uh, sort of reorganize the entire group in that sense. And, and that sort of transition seems to be more reflective of the underlying potential of, of how people are actually coupled. Uh, I, I just thought it would be interesting to bring it up. Any, anyone has thoughts on that? Yeah, I remember last year, 
Scott present, I think it was last year, no, three years ago. Scott presents a, a work that he have done uh, with a dancer in a create, during a creative process. Uh, Max, and perhaps you are aware of that and you can help it. But what Scott do, and, and I think one of the main issues here is what are we looking for? What, what are the most accurate measures that we can use to identify the synchronizations or different states of synchronizations? And as much as I remember, what Scott do is he collects the data with motion capture, a lot of dimensions, then he run a, a PCA, perform a, a principal component analysis, where he identified what was the most relevant uh, uh, variable. And then based on that variable, he ran the relative height, I think, and identified not only the states, but the transitions between states of synchronization during the creative process. So mm -hmm. of course, we must be aware when we are dealing with, uh, with uh, interpersonal coordination, we are working on a high dimensional spaces. So every time that we try to measure something, we will lose information. And I remember that, that study that, that Scott presented, he, he, was, he, he identified and he can describe and explain the transition between states for one dimension. So he left out all the other dimensions that the dancer performed. So yeah, trying I to really answer to Suzanne, uh, I, I think one of the main issues, me and Milio struggle with these every time, what are the most relevant information, what are the most relevant variables that we need to capture and to identify the synchronizations or coordinations or synergies between persons. Which is the next one? Who should I pass the ball now? Uh, I don't know if uh, Mungsen wanted to say something before you uh, completed your second sentence. Were you going to oh, say yeah. something? No, I was just trying to comment on that the dance project was really fun. Um, and I, and I think, I don't know if Scott is watching this, I hope, I'll be dead, uh, that uh, it depends on what you want to see in that, uh, in that dance, right? It's a rich, uh, very rich dynamics and behavior with emotion. And, uh, but we're trying to um, find out the non-emotional variables in there that will explain the uh, the beauty of the dance. So it depends on who is looking at it and what, what people are looking for. Um, uh, and, and I think the um, some of the difference between how I think about these things and how Scott think about these things is that I do wonder how the all these dimensions are work together. Um, there are a lot of in-phase and anti-phase uh, interactions and transitions in that um, then uh, when you look at just two variables, right? The two arms, how they're moving, or two lats, how they're moving, how the lats and torsos are, are relative to each other, um, moving relative to each other. But the uh, this is another levels of synergy where we were talking about all this dyadic coupling and then and we're back to the theme of integrating all the dyadic relations and back to a a system view of of what this dance really is. It's I think it's very difficult and and um, yeah, <laughs> I'm just adding that that particular. Oh. Uh, Charles, did you want to say something? Hmm? Was that for me? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to pick up on the idea of transitions here because that was something I spent some time talking about in my talk. And when we think about dyadic coordination, you know, there's work out there where we can look at wavelet coherence or correlation maps or things like this to try to preserve some information about the level or degree of coordination as it varies over time. So in a bivariate case. Right, and you can more or less see, you know, I showed a, a, a wavelet plot yesterday and you can see when there's a period of high co coherence and you can see when it drops out. So to me, that's one of these sort of low hanging uh, opportunities for seeing when there's a change in the coordination. Um, and, but then it goes back to this question for me about like, when does it actually matter that there's that change? So with, with dance, you know, maybe it's part of the performance, right? That you want to uh, create some excitement or some diversity where part of it is synchronized, part of it's like asynchronized. But with the team, with teamwork, um, you know, I'm trying to understand, well, where is it that people should be coordinating or at what sort of scales? And then when should they be transitioning? Or, or maybe 
Um, there's some nice work by Jamie Gorman that I mentioned yesterday too, that you can see these kind of reorganizations or transition points and they surround sort of surprising events to the teams. And uh, so I think Susanna, your point about well, we do context all the time with like experimental control. And it wasn't necessarily that I meant that, but I meant yeah. that when we're choosing tasks for our experiments or, our, or, or we're observing real world uh, teams or, or, or dense groups or whatever, that that's something that's difficult to parse out. What's unique to this task uh, that maybe this uh, applies to all, all football or soccer teams, one thing we're studying, maybe it's particular to this uh, pairing or something like that. Um, so I guess the, the point that I wanted to extend from here is like we know this bivariate case, we can see transitions when people are moving in and out of coordination, for example, if we have this temporal dimension to the uh, synchronization, but we don't really have good methods as far as I know for how that scales up to, to larger groups. And I think Mengsen had a nice example of that uh, yesterday. Yeah, but, but then my thought is maybe, it, does that only uh, go uh, well for this sort of relative phase type measures where we know there should be kind of cyclical behavior or not? So Guido Orgs in, per in perception has like, uh, he, they they looked at the perception of synchrony in audience members for dance, right? And they find I think the only effect they find is in transition, but mainly in the stop. Like so, that's the only time that you're that it's clearly visible from. I think they're mostly layman audience uh, that you know there's there's synchrony. So people see synchrony in the absence of it. So with, just to the point of transition. But I guess I guess I wanted I had a, a question for Mengson that like what you said, Travis actually. Uh, highlighted again. So by transition, you mean the change of one synergetic state to another synergetic state, which is different, I think, from the fluctuations of being, you know, of what you're describing, Travis, right? Like where you're, you know, you get some in sync moments and then some like, you know, dips and like, uh, yeah. And we're also just like, what we're finding is we're trying to capture like we have a series of like collaborations with uh, um with the with dancers where we're where we're trying to find harmony and dissonance and so the dis and it's just by having people try out you know flowing in and out of doing things simultaneously or together and separating those out and also changes from being in a harm harmonic state versus a dissonant state like you really need all of these actually to perceive all of the other ones, right? So the transition or the contrast really seems to be uh, where the where the money is, maybe or whatever. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. What what I think I didn't really go that much into the details of the the what the topology is really doing in there is well, the first the intuition was that if I have two configuration, if I have four people, and I have this type of different organization. I try to transition from this to this, and that's an interesting thing. And they are sort of different, but they're also kind of similar. You have two groups, maybe of different size or supply chain. Um, but what I see in the data is that the this, of course, will be, I'm trying to coordinate my fingers. These two topologies are, you know, so like you can differentiate them fine with, with the topological tools. But what is really standing out is how they change into this, what change into this. So you sort of have to connect this with this somehow. So it, it is in the, um, the the moments of transition, that moments of transition where you're trying to connect change into some two, two group, two or one, three group, that that transition itself has a very unique uh, uh, pattern. Uh, so back to what Travis said, would that, would that, you know, really uh, work with things that are non-rhythmic? I think it's more general than, as um, uh, mentioned earlier, the, the topological change is more general and uh, can be observed in uh, different type of dynamics. And it's the moment of transition, the window of the transition is unique, is non-generic is neither a two group, group nor a one three group. It's something that's, um, you can think of it as <laughs> connecting like this. I'm trying to tell my fingers are not, not lying enough, but that's a topological unique moment that is distinct from any of the stable patterns. And, and then that's actually what the tools are able to pick up uh, most efficiently is the moments of transition. Um, 
So yeah, I, I think that back to these moments are really uh, the transition moment seems to be occupied very little time. They were like, who happened and boom, done. But the 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 uniqueness of that transitional pattern and uh, highlight a moment and sort of you know uh, separate different moments of trans uh, synergy or stable patterns. They are the boundary of the stable patterns, but they are they are very unique by themselves. Uh, so have I used Petra to have to look at Yeah, we have a question from YouTube. Thank you, Travis, for being good and watching that. My goodness, you get wow. extra points. Uh, so yeah, there's a question from Aung San. Have you, have you seen it? Use spectral decomposition to look at multiple levels of uh, uh, frequency uh, coupling. Yeah, I think this uh, um, spectral decomposition, I would think about it more as a wavelet-like. And, um, Process which I, I did the like because I'm interested in multi scale analysis. So, the, Wavelet is my old love that I really love it, and I try to, um, uh, you know, try try to have a multi scale understanding of the dynamic through Wavelet. Um, but the issue here is really how the different frequency couple um, is. Uh, it is not entirely to separate them. Uh, the wavelet will help me separate them, and wavelet is a, a for example. I'm just saying, for example, wavelet is a linear method. A lot of the stuff that we have uh, are linear methods, and that's somehow paradoxical that we use linear method to study nonlinear phenomena. Uh, and and that is really the the coupling uh, here is is difficult to quantify. When we're talking about really nonlinear phenomena. And, and how do we really precisely quantify the nonlinear coupling between frequencies through linear methods? And that's, that's where I was stuck is to, I can decompose them into different levels, but uh, how precisely can we um, quantify these interactions? And another issue back to the earlier theme of transitions is that uh, our methods and signal processing methods, they're linear methods, they're also for stationary signals. And we can, we can sort of decompose them to windows as in the um, first of different sites, like in wavelet, uh, um, et cetera. Um, but the, the nature of the measure itself is sort of non-synergistic. Um, so the, yeah, so we we with the knob by using the decomposition solve the problem of putting back of putting the decomposed the, the components back together. So we still have to solve the putting back together part of the decomposition. Um, yeah, I don't. I hope I hope that under <laughs> answer his question. I'm looking for a sign that he has, but we'll see if it comes up in a minute when he hears what you've just said. Uh, the lag in Zoom makes it a bit difficult uh, between Zoom and, and, and YouTube. Um, I had a thought, um, and it's probably been done, but uh, so one thing that's been sort of uh, coming up in my head is that the question of, you know, when when is synergy useful or good or helpful towards the end goal, which is useful in applications, whether it's, you know, clinical scenarios, education scenarios, sports, music, and so on. And uh, I'll come back to this idea of initiation because I think it's so important because there you know, uh, at some point they're gonna become coupled. Um, and there's something in that phase, which is clearly good. It gets people together. And so I'm wondering if uh, from, my, from my background, you could use data which provides a pattern, whether it's topology or otherwise, and then use that in a machine learning type of way to then search through your time series for other instances of, of true coupling, as it were. So I wondered if people had a, a thought about that. Obviously, PCA is another way of going about it, but there you might get you know, other spurious uh, examples of coupling. So I don't know, Meng Sang looks like she may have a thought. <laughs> I think I've been talking too much. Anyone else have, have thoughts on this? <laughs> but... Uh... Alexander, does that mean you have a thought of being unmuted? Oh, uh, no, I just want to resonate with you that actually I, uh, at our lab at RPI, we have actually the same question because there's a lot of research 
on synchronization where people synchronize without uh, them actually wanting it, so against their will. So this puts up the question, mm -hmm. what about the tasks that require asynchronous behavior? Um, uh, how how would do the same mechanisms actually hinder us in their performance? And anyone who learned to play a musical instrument, I have the same experience with my son, is like, see his pain when two hands have to do very, very simple movements, but they have to be in asynchrony. You see your, if you try to help him, your brain starts exploding yourself and you realize how difficult these things are. And it actually leads to the question, how, how beneficient all these synchroni uh, synchronization mechanisms in phase and interface coordination are for our modern tasks that are not in the traditional um, environment that our genes are accustomed to. And uh, this is why we are also uh, developing a more controlled virtual environment actually to study this phenomena. Uh, Dr. Wayne Gray, uh, I wish he, he, um, uh, uh, he was there. Um, uh, we developed a joint action game uh, to uh, study exactly this phenomenon that enable us to um, in a controlled manner to set up these scenarios that would be able to answer the questions um, where the tasks are um, are, um, are to, to, to perform asynchronous uh, movements that are beneficial uh, uh, for, uh, for task accomplishment. And the nice thing about the, the, uh, the, the task that he uh, pre uh, presented that we're developing is that um, the environment is in this task fairly static. Which is, uh, which is a very, very um, great uh, feature to have because it means the sole, um, sole uh, determinant of the success of the subject's interaction within the task comes from the interactions, not from the environment. So you don't have the confounding between the dynamic environment and the dynamic of the, uh, of the subject's interactions. Yeah. These are just my thoughts that I like to throw out. No, those are great because, and I saw Pedro nodding vigorously. So maybe you have something to say about that. No, because just, really... just a comment, just a comment, because we should not assume that synergies are always good. That is one thing that I, I, I conclude with, with João. For now, our, our main problem so far is how to measure synergies. And then the second step, for, well, not the second, but not the second, but one of the further steps, it will be our synergies always good or, or not. Perhaps sometimes it is useful that two players can cooperate to each other, but some other times, probably in the same situation that one player need to play individually and to perform some kind of te technical action without care with, with the partner. So that is another thing. We, can, we should not assume that having synergy, it, it is always good for performance. I, I'm not sure if it is. I'm not sure. One, one thing that Giacomo, Giacomo opened the mic. Go on. Sorry, I thought Merle, my follow up on this, uh, talking about her previous research where she shows that indeed too much synchrony can be terribly bad. Uh, she, she has been doing this very nicely with the fMRI data using a finger tapping task with a virtual partner. Mer, do you want to say something about it? Because I think it links very nicely with this point. Well, yes, I mean, I had, I had two things to say, and that, that's clearly a very, uh, a very important one that, um, you know, being too synchronous, too, uh, too in sync with somebody else can lead to what I call um, self other blurring. But the idea being that, you know, at least in musical performance to simply perform the task uh, you need to have a very clear sense of who you are and who the other person is and, and the results of your and their action need to be clear in space and time so that you can accommodate and adapt accordingly. If there is too much of this self other blurring, too much uh, synergy, then clearly it becomes very uh, detrimental to task performance. So I definitely think that that is, is, is key in, in musical performance at least. And it sort of brings me to another point, which is this idea of decoupling, which is in music, and I assume in sports, there are these attractors, right? Like you get pulled towards uh, somebody. And that's what I was trying to describe in my group walking task, that we are pulled uh, implicitly to others through social cues, whether it's similarity or, or otherwise. And sometimes that's detrimental to, you know, getting the ball to the goal or, you know, focusing on this really hard part in the music. So we need to actively decouple, in fact, in these instances. And so when we, are, as researchers, are you know, in search of almost uh, almost naively focused entirely on synchrony and on synergy, we maybe forget that there are these very vital moments where we want our participants in, indeed to, to perform the task properly 
to, to segregate out uh, other information, to, to uncouple from, from other agents. So I don't know if that was sort of what you were uh, looking for, Giacomo, but those are definitely uh, some but of my- In part, I was thinking about Bruno Rep and Peter Keller work where, where they kind of train a virtual partner to adapt more or less to you tapping in synchrony with, with the virtual partner. And they, and they show basically that the optimal synchronization occur in a sort of sweet spot in between being not adaptive at all and too much adaptive. And too much adaptivity doesn't lead to ceiling synchrony, but in, indeed it disrupts the synchronization process. That's why I, I thought that, that that kind of work, which you followed up beautifully with the fMRI um, was relevant. Um, yeah, there's something else I wanted to add regarding this point. You, you said, when would desynchronization be useful? So some of the work I, uh, I, I did with Peter and lots of work Peter Keller did in the past deal with this idea of balancing between integration and segregation. And in music, it's, it's really important because sometimes you might want to actually decouple from another musician because you want to rely more on internal processing, for example. And, uh, and, and this may maybe rely less on attending what another person is doing. Uh, it happens in music a lot because people kind of have a shared representation of what they want to, to play, like a score in their head. And sometimes they need to attend more to what another person is doing. And for doing that, they kind of tune in. But, but, but later it can also happen that they, they need to rely more on, on their own representation of, 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 of the performance. For example, imagine a situation in which you are a leader and you think that the tempo should, should drastically change in a different direction. In this case, you, would, you might want to disrupt the synchronization because you would basically introduce a slightly a, a small drift and you would expect the follower to, to basically follow you in that. And doing that requires a sort of executive uh, high level functioning that allows you to kind of stop the, the, the connection with your partner, focusing more on yourself uh, sort of locus of control uh, variable that uh, Peter and, and Merle have, uh, have used in, in the past. Yeah, so th maybe this is an example where uh, you, you might want to stop the synchrony or synchrony is no good or it's better not to synchronize. It, it won't lead to anti-phase synchronization probably, but it would still break it down for a reasonable degree. Does anybody want to pick up on that, Meng Sen? Yeah, <laughs> you're just speaking of me. You uh, just happen to be right next to me on, okay, on, on our Brady okay. Bunch array, so I, you know, but I can't help but look at you. Yeah, I, I can't, I can't uh, pick that up of uh, the ball again. Uh, I think it was really interesting when it comes to music that, um, as you just said, sometimes people need to decouple, uh, and I think it also depends on what instrument people are playing, and there, there, there is a role in that in the band. And uh, if uh, I'm, I don't play a drum, but drummers are much more stable uh, and, and they, they keep the time uh, uh, for the entire group. And for me, I'm a singer, so I, I kind of in and out, but I, I pay attention to what they're doing. I need to be go with the entire band, but the entire band is listening to the drummer. And, uh, but sometimes their guitar player is just not on beat. And then I need to decouple and then I need to select who I'm actually listening to in that scenario. So it's, it's, it is like music performance will be much more complex. And then the, I think the directionality of the, um, the coupling is also very interesting. When we're thinking about synchrony, we're thinking mostly about something bi-directional, um, but in this more slightly more complex context of uh, not more slightly more kind of very much complex concept of the context of, of music performance, I think the tension uh, is very directed in that in that sense. I'm, I'm momentarily maybe listening to this person or the guitar or listen to the bass or listen to the drum. I sort of try to listen to the the, the elements that's more most stable, help me stabilize my uh, my performance. But if everyone was just synchronizing without a directionality, it would, you know, just trying to synergize with others, then. It's very likely a uh, small chaos and the performance will, you know, overthrow the entire uh, music performance. Uh, and I'm just talking about that out of more like anecdotal uh, um, uh, experience um, to, to, 
absurd as but it's like. it's very per uh, pertinent to this idea of these re reorganized patterns you know these transitions from from one state into another right so i think it's it, it wasn't only anecdotal it, it was really useful right to, to have a think about um what those patterns might look like and what factors determine which pattern you're in um reliability is this question that's come in to various talks over the last two days and you know because we're here to talk about you know quantitative or computational um, approaches, you know, there are lots of ways in which we can describe reliability. You know, I talked about two different kinds today. You can be have, you know, reliable in yourself versus there can be stability, you know, or coherence across the group. So maybe people have some thoughts about, you know, are we talking about different phenomena when we talk about reliability of, of others versus, you know, the general stability of the group? Um, and also, you know, something that, that occurs to me is, is, is sometimes maybe in the, the framework of sports, this is, is the case, that unpredictability is a good thing too. And certainly in music, that's the case, right? So you don't only want to be reliable if you want to play something that people want to listen to. And you definitely don't want to be completely predictable if you want to beat the other team. So, you know, we, we conceptually, theoretically have said reliability is this really important thing to, 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 to help us synchronize with others. But certainly, that isn't always uh, true. So if people have thoughts about this idea of the reliability of, uh, of signals, either an individual signal or stability of the group, this would be the next topic we could discuss. <laughs> um, just to, just to um, quickly comment on the, um, about uh, uh, people, a group of people playing music together. I think uh, Mengshin was saying about uh, what kind of role you have, what kind of instrument you, you play, it would be an important factor in wh what kind of position you are uh, you're in. And like if you play the drums, then you you are the you are the metric of the of, of the band. But then I think it's also very important how much of these musicians might have experience in these uh, in these instruments. Because if the task was like say the task was really simple, you're playing a really easy drum beat that you've you're pretty much mastered, and that's just so simple that you know that you, you're going to keep it, and you you know that people are going to follow it. You're not going to mess it up. Then you might just you know go. You you might not really as much engage with the group as as such. But then say if you are um, just starting with your um, with your bass guitar. And then your the, the task is already so challenging for you that you don't have this luxury to be listening to other people. You have to decouple and you have to be focusing on yourself. So it really, I think that kind of expertise, it, it has to be a balance of um, the task being like too easy that you would just go out of it or like the task being too difficult that you just don't have the luxury to be focusing on other people. And I think this kind of synergy um, where these kind of synergy really comes is when um, the group are sort of in a similar level of expertise, and then they're going to doing something that nobody has played before. So let's so, so say they've been like jamming uh, the, the tunes that they already know uh, for five minutes, and then suddenly someone uh, suggests like a, like an improvisation where they start taking on a different route. And now everyone has to be focusing on here and has to be uh, listening to other people. And that's where I think these kind of synergies might, uh, synergy must, might come when you're uh, kind of approaching somewhere that's, um, that's not your comfort zone anymore, but it's approachable enough that you can still listen to other people and not just focus on yourself. So, yeah. Just I think at Marilis, uh, when the the kids singing together is a, was a really great example of this, actually. And we're also seeing this in people trying to remember a song together uh, instead of a song that you that they already know wrote. Like there's so much more, you know, focus on the interaction of when you're like kind of, you know, you're finishing each other's sentence and you're jumping in. And like it's a it's a, it's a very intuitive thing. But like I feel like if you're just looking at data devoid which i do a lot devoid from like any kind of video input or anything like that you forget about exactly what you're uh, what you're saying and it's it's hard to always stay in the yeah anyway mm -hmm. i want just agreeing i think with your you're saying. Yeah. yeah just let me add something i, I think what uh, adding bring us is, is, is was something like um, the, the effects of learning on synergies formation because I think we must, when we talk about synchronization or synergies formation, I think we must saw the phenomenon on two different scales. 
uh, on a short time scale, when there is a synergy formation and transitions between those synergy formations during the course of an action. And the other is it is trying to describe or explain uh, the synergy formation of synchroni synchronization patterns on a long time scale due to the effects of learning. I think this is two different scales of analysis that we need to, to be aware. And I'm, I'm quite interesting. Uh, that is one of the things that I've been spoken with, with João is, is trying to find out the, the effects of learning on synergies formations in team sports. That is a very interesting thing that we aim to analyze very soon. The, the other is to something that I think is, it was Giacomo that, that bring that topic. How, how, how can synergy, talking about the decoupling again, how, how the synergies can change during the course of an action because it is possible to measure the strength of the synergy. Is it possible during, for instance, when we, when we saw a, a football team moving forward and we can capture this, the strength of the synergy of, of that football team, the values of the synergy change during the course of that action. We do not know yet how to, to capture these because we do not know how to measure the dynamics of synergies formation. We, have, we try some, we do some trials, but it didn't, didn't went very well. We have some need to struggle with some kind of multicollinearity issues that we do not know how to solve it yet. Okay, there's two things. One is the, the, the short and long time scales. And, um, and the other is that uh, during the course of an action, how, how, how this synergies formation may, may change the values. So I have something to say about learning. Alexander, do you have something specific to say to that? Oh, no, I'll wait for you. Oh, thank you. Um, oh. No, I, I, I sort of wanted to jump in there um, because to sort of pick up on what Hiron also said, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, um, is this idea of learning seems so key uh, because when we think about why we actually do these things together, you know, play together, whether it's music or sports, it's usually to learn, right, about one another, uh, to figure out strategies that make us get together quicker or find out why some people just don't ever get better at, uh, at synchronizing and at becoming uh, in sync with us. So uh, with this in mind, as if the idea is that we do these things to learn, I wonder if we can sort of use that uh, in a way that, that helps us look at the data across time. So if we find out that people, and I think um, if, I'm, if I'm correct in saying this, like, uh, you can look at Leon Noy's work, for example, the speed at which experts recover after a perturbation. Um, so there's this idea of expertise makes you uh, learn quicker, as it were, uh, to, to, to respond to a perturbation. But also maybe in naive people and in, in, a, in a task that's not too hard or too easy, but where you can sort of look at their learning ability across time. Um, I think that the, what I'm trying to get at is that there's, there must be some nice study out there where you compare experts, or rather you compare expertise versus experience and the role that maybe priors play in that. So that's another thing to throw in there. You know, if you've played with this collection of people, you already have a sense of who's gonna do what when, um, you know, orchestras and uh, sports uh, teams often will just have this artillery, these strategies in mind of how they're gonna move from one synergistic pattern to another and so on and so on. Um, what's interesting is what happens when you throw something unexpected in there and, and how, they, how they recover. And if they are experts, hopefully they recover quickly. And if they're not, uh, maybe not. So if anybody has something to think about this idea of uh, learning and what we can do with the data to, to look at these learning effects, I think that would be particularly nice. But Alexander, why don't you hop in? Uh, I could actually comment on what you uh, just said. And uh, um, the, this is something that you do in our lab because uh, we don't consider a development expertise as a linear curve. You only get linear curves when you consider averages of uh, groups. And this actually disguises the, the individual path to expertise. So one, um, I, I find this tool very, very good uh, that uh, Dr. Wayne Gray has developed is the Plateau Deeps and Leaps framework is to look at performance in terms of plateau steeps and leaps and which uh, resembles the constant uh, cycle of strategy discovery uh, testing out and adaptation so uh, when uh, this um, look at the data um, which uh, one of our graduates Russell Rahman has done he's developed a um, a um, a tool called spotlight for, uh, for investigation this matter investigating this matter so when you um, 
in terms of performance, when you when you discover a new strategy, your performance dips because you first um, you, you you discover something new, something that you're not used to, and therefore you you struggle with it, and then you try to incorporate it into your uh, behavioral arsenal, and uh, if you are successful, in that then your performance leaps. And uh, you, your performance, rather than being a linear curve or asymptotic curve, it kind of makes a sleep. And afterwards, when you when you optimize the strategy and automatize the, the behavioral motor components to this, your performance kind of plateaus. And uh, there you can either stick to your strategy, which Dr. Gray um, refers to as stable suboptimal performance. So people who actually are um, are able to uh, uh, perform better, but do not because they do not discover and adapt the new strategies, which uh, one of the challenges of the framework is to finding out whether somebody is at his peak performance or whether he's actually stable suboptimal performance. And the, um, uh, yeah. So th this was regards to that, I just want to throw out. And the other part, I actually want to comment on what Haran said that, um, uh, what uh, uh, then uh, with regards to uh, synchronizing and, and improvising with regards to music that uh, it is best when um, when everybody at this is at the same level uh, and I want to maybe extend this example say maybe that maybe there are some other special case uh, thinking about your introduction and also from my experience with children is that um, if you think about skills of children and adults they're vastly different but uh, parents, or maybe somebody else vastly enjoys singing together with the kids, even though they completely are not on the same level as adults. So um, perhaps not uh, even uh, the the there's other than process of learning. We should also consider what um, and this goes to your in the direction of the paper that you posted, Merle, is also with regards to bonding that um, the synchrony allows us to uh, kind of uh, an, an affectionate level to bond with the other person, uh, which brings us pleasure. So even though that the adult is much more advanced in singing than the child, which my wife, for example, is, she has, she has been singing all of her life in Catholic choir, whereas my children, they're kind of screaming like they want. And still she very much enjoys synchronizing and engaging the synchronous activity with them. And from this very, very subjective, okay, N equals one case, uh, I could say that um, for her, the motivation is actually bonding rather than uh, yeah, learning. Thank you. Uh, can I just add a quick comment on, on that? So I think I think there's a um, um, slight difference in, in the example you give though, because um, when, when the adults come and sing with the children, we're talking about synchrony as in unison singing, where we're all singing the same same thing. And that can have like, a, that can have a sort of different kind of intention behind it compared to say the musicians um, start jamming in a different way. And then because everyone's playing different instruments, they have their freedom to be doing whatever they want. They're not playing the same notes all together. So then it's, it's, and that's when I meant that because you all have the, uh, you have all your flexibility in exploring the ideas, but you still have to be listening to the chord changes that the, the, the keyboard player might, might going to bring and, and so on. So I think it's slightly different to everyone um, uh, singing uh, the same thing or playing the same thing in, in unison in, in that yeah. sense. Yeah, I, I agree. Fair enough. The, that's, that's a very good point. This actually the, the, the one paper that I posted in the chat that's actually contributes to uh, a more, uh, how do you say it, a more, uh, more fine grade terminology with regards to synchronization because they um, explore what uh, Mengsen mentioned yesterday also is that we couplings um, are more beneficial in a special type of coordination named the unstable coordination. So where the, the actions are not synchronized uh, in rather in, in phase or anti phase, which singing would have been, but rather in, in a much more um, yeah, asynchronous action. So one hits the hammer three times, the other one two times, which goes into uh, yeah, what you said, yeah. Mengsen, did you have something to say? Yeah, I do. <laughs> as I go on. Uh, the, uh, I sort of try to like, like, uh, kind of find a common theme uh, uh, in the in the comments that for the last few person who has spoken. I, well, I want to drive it to the idea of multi scale uh, coordination. So we're thinking about individual expertise. We're thinking about the more the the, the synergy within the person, or uh, how do I organize my behavior within. And then we're thinking about team coordination. We're thinking about how we're organizing behavior between people. 
but we can also see that as a sort of a continuum of, of uh, coordination. Uh, and how is my intrapersonal coordination would affect my ability to perform on a different scale uh, between person. And, and, and to get to the part of learning, I think is even more interesting is that um, what is the learning, at what scale the learning is happening? I need to improve, like if I'm playing guitar, I'm a terrible guitar player. Uh, I will need to bring up my interpersonal coordination to a certain level to maybe better it a team player uh, with other people. And, uh, and then, then in reverse, there's also interesting question of um, uh, transfer of, of, of skills or transfers of expertise as we learn these stuff from other people, we have to have, we're not gonna be independently become an amazing musician without ever interact with, interact with other people, right? So, so this, that's why we need teachers and et cetera. Um, so there's a, a, the, the top down part of the, the story of how is the large scale, you know, the microscope but interpersonal coordination would actually maybe stabilizing uh, interpersonal skills and and going back and forth as as a uh, sort of multi seal learning of, of, of a group. Uh, yeah, I just want to throw it in there. It seems to be relevant to um, uh, what everyone has been saying. No, absolutely. I think um, this idea of learning becomes so, so important. Um, but I, I, I wonder if we can maybe now uh, turn to some of the other questions that I had, uh, had put down, which uh, maybe can uh, feel some, some new thoughts, which is, uh, you know, what part of the signal do we want to use? Uh, so we're, we're trying to focus on data here today. What, what parts of the signal do we use? So obviously you can use, you know, peaks, you can use uh, so frequency or amplitude. I'd like to have a think collectively about what we should be looking at in the signal, very specifically about the characteristics in the signal. So if anybody has thoughts about that, that would be very exciting and interesting to me. Perhaps we should first define what type of data we are looking at, because the discussion so far jumped back and forth in between brain and behavior, but really, I don't think all the assumptions hold for both, right? I, I, absolutely, and uh, maybe we can have a think about whether or not it's useful to find common common parameters that we can look at at both, or whether that's futile. Um, so yeah, I think that that's all built into, into that. Uh, more abstract question than I have, but absolutely brain and behavior will almost certainly have, uh, you know, in terms of what the signal looks like will be different. Um, and then, you know, as Pedro mentioned, his stage is different again. So, but Pedro has unmuted himself. So maybe he has some. Yeah, I, I think, I think it always depends. So concerning the question, what part of the signal should we use? It depends on the research question that we have in hand. For instance, in one of the papers that me and Milu cooperate, uh, and it was in major revisions now, we only use the peaks of uh, time series, the peaks, the, the upward and the backward peaks. It is an acyclical task. So for that kind of problem that we have in hand, we only use the peaks. But for, for instance, if I want to capture the synergies between two rugby players during a two versus one situation, which might long five seconds, I use the entire signal because I want to see the synergies formation during the course of an action. So it depends, at least for, for, from the kind of, of research that I do, it, it, it depends always from the research question that we have in hand. So it's difficult to say, okay, I, I will only use the peaks or I, mean, or I will use the entire data. Joan, I don't know if you want to add something here, but it's more or less these. And just to follow up on that, and this was also my concern yesterday about modalities, right? And, and I think this ties back into the question earlier of when it might synchrony or coordination not be a good thing. And I think that that's modality specific, I'll call it, because, and also context specific, because I can imagine a case where um, some people are looking at uh, coordination type phenomena in romantic partners, for example, and you know, maybe there's some point that you need to decouple and, and maybe it's something about your physiology or your arousal level, you know, if you're in a disagreement or things like this, that it's important that you don't just continue to uh, 
synchronize an increase in arousal level uh, during a disagreement, you need to have some regulation on that. Um, so I don't know Marilla, if there's a good answer to that, what part of the signal it does depend on the, the modality that you're looking at, the, the phenomena, and I think also the time scale. Um, and yeah, how, how long is this period that you're observing? And I guess maybe this is not a real, this is just an extension from that, that I see really uh, little work on this longitudinal aspect of coordination, which ties into learning. Uh, you know, if you're looking at many sessions of musicians, for example, and how do they coordinate as they learn to, to, to perform together, we see a little bit of this in um, psycho psychotherapy studies that there's a starting to be a bit of work looking at movement uh, synchrony um, over many sessions. And I'm also doing some of that work with physiology. Um, but it, I don't know if, if that's another aspect to this multi-scale component. I can look within a period of observation, but I can also look across a collective of observations. And I, I would expect that there should be some changes, but I don't know what they should be also yet. No, that was that was exactly the kind of things I, would, I, I was hoping we could, uh, you know, just lay out on the table is that, you know, people watching and maybe some of uh, some of the people here, you know, aren't aware of what the toolbox is for analyzing this kind of data. And I think that that's maybe one of the outputs of this uh, little workshop is that maybe somebody should uh, take the ball uh, and and try and, and, and make a good summary of, of what the options are uh, for dealing with time course data of this kind. Um, and one thing that sort of also strikes me is uh, something that I had in big and bold on one, on the slide that I uh, showed to you when I was playing the little video is that um, I'm very keen to see, you know, uh, most people will uh, look at this data either as a whole, so looking at coherence across the group, for example, or, um, you know, dyadic coupling um, between nodes within the group. Um, is that the only way to do things? Um, and really one of the biggest questions I have is whether we should be abandoning the dyadic coupling at all. Uh, you know, is, is, is that just us sort of hanging on to methods that were already there and that seem to work? Uh, do we have to throw that out and start again when we, we realize that it's a very different thing um, cognitively and computationally when you've got multiple signals uh, to deal with? So I don't know if anybody wants to pick up the ball on that one. I'll pick it up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to say, I think, uh, especially when we talk about dyadic coupling, uh, I think it's it's important to differentiate, I think, when we talk about dyadic coupling at a actual informational level or how we happen to measure it. Um, so the for the modeling work that I've been doing is that um, probably counterintuitively, you, even with dyadic coupling as informational coupling, there's actually information exchange between these two persons or oscillators that uh, they can create an interaction that goes beyond the uh, dyadic relation. So they can create collective structure um, based on um, uh, dyadic interaction. So I think this is <clears throat> two different parts of the story. Um, as, I, as I said earlier about like, if we are um, like uh, forming a circle, if a group of people are trying to form a circle or a bunch of you know molecules trying to, to uh, conform into a certain shape to perform a certain function, it is not that necessary that you have to have a complicated bonds between people. You don't have to, if you are, if all of us are trying to hold our hands and stand in a circle, we can still uh, perform that task through dyadic coupling uh, informationally between people. Um, but the, 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 the final result of the connective, uh, the dyadic interaction could be something that uh, cannot be solely described by local information. And uh, so I, I think I would go back to the, to the scale of, of um, the description is I think dyadic interaction is how we look at this microscopic level, we can describe the system in terms of the, this person is connected that person and with, with that person. But when we're talking about the different skills, 
it doesn't it doesn't contradict the fact that there are also dyadic interaction. Um, but it can also have a higher levels of structure of what these dyadic interactions are actually adding up to. Uh, so at a different scale, maybe the, 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 uh, we will not be talking in terms of dyadic interaction anymore. We have to talk about uh, shapes of, the core of these synergies in general. And then go back to the beginning of the, uh, the conversation where we're talking about manifolds is, um, and I said a synchronization in the traditional sense correspond to one type of manifold, but there are different types of manifolds. Uh, the, but the interpretability, uh, we as scientists, we also want our methods to be interpretable. We want to interpret our manifold as synchronization. That is a word that we know, have intuition about. Uh, and then when I talk about homology or <laughs> shapes of manifold forming different numbers of whole, what does it even mean uh, to a regular person and it's a scientist as a person? Uh, yeah, I think where things are will be somewhere in between. We're moving from something that we're really consider interpretable as synchronization and towards something slightly more abstract at this point and, and then try to come up with better ideas of of building, not only building the tools, I think in this at this point, in the context of this workshop is also having the intuition, the tools that give us intuition and insights uh, about how we really see group coordination at a personal level. Um, that would be my comments. And I was sort of uh, thinking uh, specifically about sort of the, the context that Pedro and Hua work in, which is that, you know, there there's a much more sequential um, I may be making this up, but to me, it seems uh, very different to say the musical case where, where you will have, uh, you know, maybe your circle example is quite neat that way because it's sort of an in-between case. But as I see it, like a play in, in sports is much more sequential in that. And then, and you have to predict what the next dyad is going to do and the dyad after that when doing your uh, direct coupling. So I, that, that's sort of why I was wondering whether, you know, we have this bias towards uh, trying to understand the dyadic uh, interactions, but I'm worried that sometimes they get in the way, right? So I was I was sort of hoping that maybe Pedro um, uh, could, could tell us about how they deal with these more sequential dyadic couplings. I will try. I'm not sure if I can get it. Well, I, I agree with what uh, Maxon said. Um, in, in in sport in music and but well basically in the in all human movement and mo in most part of social interactions we are linked we are coupled by information in sports we are the players are coupled by visual information so every time they they move or every time people when players moves on the field offer information to the others regarding the possibilities of action that each one can do. And it is this kind of uh, visual perception and action that lead the players to anticipate what the others can do. And this is uh, crucial to, to where each one of the players are linked to. Okay, in, in, a, in a football field or in a rugby field or in a basket, basketball field, we have the ball carrier, which is, okay, we can say probably it can be a leader of, of the process because everybody wants the ball and everybody wants to, to intercept the ball from the defenders and from the attackers want to create opportunities to pass the ball. So there is a, always a sequential analysis of the possibilities of action that each one of the players offer to the others. And this is what we want to capture when we collect positional data of the players. So I'm not sure if I answered the question. I, I, I'm not sure if I understand what you talk about the sequential dyadic behavior. Can you be a little bit more explicit? No, I think I think you did. I mean, so the thought would be that um, there will be dependencies between sequential dyads right so i will pass to you you will pass to Meng Sen, Meng Sen will pass to travis yeah. and so on and so on but 
I will have to think about monks and passing yeah. to Travis when I'm passing. See, this one of the questions that one reviewer put me in one of the papers that I have now is, uh, what about the initial, the initial, the, the sensitivity of the initial conditions regarding these synergy issues in in a in sports? And we answer that the the initial conditions, the sensitive is continuously changing every time that a player moves on the field, offer information and offer and which define the possibilities of action of each one of the players. Moreover, when several players behave in a certain way, they also offer opportunities of action of the other players. And in, in, in sports, it's a little bit different from music because we, we have two kinds of um, probably two kinds of synchronizations or two levels of synchronization. The ones who want to cooperate and we also perhaps we have synchrony between the opponents. So we have a cooperative and a competitive. There is some kind of complementarity that, that occurs during, during a, a team sports match. Something that is completely different from the other social interaction that, with the exception probably with the war or fighting or whatsoever. So to answer your question, yes, there is a dynamical coupling, perception and electric coupling that defines the possibilities of action of each one of the, the, the persons involved. And this means that the, the, all the synchronization patterns and all the synergies are continuously changing due to these um, movements, actions of the players. I'm not sure if I was clear. You were completely clear, but it's now made my brain hurt with this idea that we, you know, the, the, this idea of the potential for actions. And I'm sorry, Suzanne has left because I think that that's sort of also why, you know, in these more ecological settings and sports being probably the most ecological, that you have difficulty in finding synergistic patterns is because, you know, the, the, the degrees of freedom, like, you know, how many options are available is just, yeah. is, is, yeah. is infinite. Uh, so I sort of am going to bring us to a close as we come up to 5.30 here in Germany because I have to go and feed my children. Okay. Um, but this has been incredibly uh, useful, at least for me, and I'm sure for everybody watching on YouTube and who will watch again uh, when they get to replay this. Um, but we can continue this at another time. The beauty of these online conferences is that we are not paying for hotel rooms or flights. So if anybody is interested in, in doing this again with these uh, collection of people, or indeed inviting other people, uh, we can do this as often as anybody wants. Uh, this is the beauty of this. Uh, one has to look for the silver lining. COVID has reminded us that everybody is just a Zoom link away. So if anybody here is interested in uh, talking again, and Meng Sen, we promise not to keep throwing the ball at you. Uh, you're just too good. What can we say? You're like you're like the the, the, the man of the match, right? You, you you just we had to keep throwing the ball to you. Uh, but if uh, if anybody's interested, you can contact me, and I will put it together. It's what I do best. I don't have any many answers. I have lots of questions, uh, but I'm happy to 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 create the the forum for us to talk. And if people want to collaborate and write some sort of uh, uh, piece on methods available and when they should be used. I think that would be an amazing output and something that the field definitely needs as we try and do more work mm -hmm. on group coordination. I love the nodding heads, but I hope that means synergy. Uh, yeah. And uh, I hope that you will uh, continue to listen in tomorrow. We have Pedro giving his talk uh, tomorrow morning. And uh, Pedro, I hope you will be able to join us for questions. Because I, I, I will, no, no, for, almost for sure that I, I can join for, for, the, for the questions. The thing is, I will start my class at the, at the faculty exactly at the same time of my talk. That's why I sent the video. Uh, but I will put the students do some kind of work. I will ask permission in 10 minutes, I'll be back. And then I'll go to the, to the Zoom and then I'll back to the class again. So don't if worry, it's any I'll be there. I had to do I'll the same there. thing this morning. <laughs> oh, okay, 10, 20, I'll be there, don't worry. Or perhaps a little bit earlier. Well, we, we are so, so glad to have you with us because I think uh, with okay. a huge bias towards uh, uh, ensemble music uh, work, it was good to have uh, a different perspective from a different ecological setting. So, but I want to thank you all for connecting. Um, and uh, yeah, you guys have been even better than I expected, which I keep telling you, I have these like super high expectations of, of life and everybody in it. So you guys have surpassed expectations. You all get A stars. 
Um, I hope you all have a nice evening. Uh, Mungsen, have a lovely day. Uh, we've made you wake up bright and early, so you can't possibly not have one, uh, except we've probably tired you out. Uh, and uh, I hope to hear you and see you all uh, again soon, and, and if not tomorrow. And I thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.